Now we're ready to tackle the first of our three questions, and that first one is, what makes a mapping one-to-one? -one? So we know what it means intuitively. It means that a single point in the z-plane gets mapped to a single point in the w-plane, and, and vice versa. Well, what does it mean mathematically? What is the mathematical requirement for an f of z mapping to be one-to-one? -one? Well, to answer that question, let's think ahead a little bit. So the third question, if you remember, is what does Laplace's equation transform to in the w-plane, from the z-plane to the w-plane? In order to do that transformation, we're going to meet, need to be able to transform derivatives with respect to x and y into derivatives with respect to u and v, from the z to the w-plane. So the way we do that is through transformation laws. And they basically just apply the chain rule to two functions, in this case u, and v that are both functions of x and y. So here they are. So partial partial x is partial u partial x partial partial u plus partial v partial x partial partial v. Great. And then the second one is partial partial y is partial u partial y times partial partial u plus partial v partial y times partial partial v. So these would be the transformation laws we would use. Any partial partial x, we'd substitute this any partial partial y, we would substitute this. So in order to determine if a mapping is one-to-one, -one, let's consider the inverse mapping. So that's the capital F of w going from the w-plane back to the z-plane. So what we'll do in order to accomplish that is to look at these two equations as two equations for two unknowns. The unknowns will be partial partial u and partial partial v. So we can write this in matrix form as follows. So you notice I've put the partial partial x, partial partial y on the right hand side to make it look like our normal matrix problem. Here is the unknown and here is the 2 by 2 coefficient matrix. So what we have is a 2 by 2 non-homogeneous, because this is not equal to 0, system of equations. In order for us to have a unique solution of that system of equations, we would have to have that the coefficient matrix, which consists of these partial derivatives, have its determinant be non-zero. If it's non-zero, we can take the inverse and bring it over and get the unique solution. So in this case, I don't actually care about the solution. I just care about what the criteria is that a solution does exist, a unique solution does exist. So we're going to call this determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix, we're going to call that the Jacobian. So for example, if you think of this in terms of Kramer's rules, we can solve this in any way that we'd like. In Kramer's rule, remember the first element in the solution, you take the first column of the coefficient matrix and replace it by the right-hand side vector, take that determinant, and then divide by the determinant of the original 2 by 2 matrix, which in this case now is the Jacobian, we'll call it J. Then the second element of the solution, you take the second column of the coefficient matrix, replace it with the right-hand side vector, take that determinant, divide by the J Jacobian and that gives us that second element. Again, I don't really care about the actual solutions here. I just want to know what has to be true for the solution to exist and be unique. And that requirement is that the Jacobian be non-zero. Now the Jacobian is this 2 by 2 determinant. So that's partial u partial x times partial v partial y minus partial v partial x times partial u partial y. So this is the Jacobian and that has to be not equal to zero in order for us to get a unique solution. So let's think about what that means. Well, in order for the Jacobian to be non-zero, let's manipulate that result for the Jacobian just a little bit to see if we can compare it to something that's, that's useful. Well, let's use the Cauchy-Riemann equations. We can do that if f of z is analytic. So if our mapping is analytic, then Cauchy-Riemann equations apply relating u and v together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this first term, and because partial u partial x is equal to partial v partial y, this first term will be partial v partial y squared. Then minus partial v partial x, well that's equal to plus partial u partial y, so then this will be partial u partial y squared. So I've rewritten that here. So that's another way to express the Jacobian if our mapping is indeed analytic. All right, so can we relate that to anything else that would help us see what's going on here? Well, if you remember back 
when we derived the Cushman equations in the first place, we had these two relationships, equations 1.8 and 1.9, that define f prime of z. If you take that second one, 1.9, that was f prime of z is equal to partial v partial y minus i times partial u partial y. Well, if I compare these, you'll notice that these partial derivatives are the same. So therefore, this Jacobian is really just the square of the modulus of f prime of z. Remember, the modulus is the square root of the sum of the squares of the real and imaginary part of our complex function. So the square of the modulus of f prime z is equal to the Jacobian. And of course, then, because of the Jacobian has to be non-zero, f prime of z also has to be non-zero in order to get a unique solution. So that leads us to the two requirements for a mapping to be one-to-one. -one. The first is, at a particular point, z0, where it's one-to-one, -one, f of z has to be analytic. And the reason for that is because I used the Cauchy-Roman equations. We assume that it was analytic in order to take advantage of the Cauchy-Roman equations. So that's the first requirement. The second requirement that we just obtained is that f prime of z at such a point has to be non-zero. If those two things are true, Cauchy-Roman equations are satisfied, it's analytic, and f prime of z is not equal to zero, then the point for which those two things are true has a single image point. The mapping is one to one. Those points where f prime of z is equal to zero, we call those critical points. And of course, it's not one to one at such critical points.